Hello, my name's Harold, self-professed redneck, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a general, general old fart that likes to do one thing or another. Uh, my one of my machine shop heroes, Tom, Tom Lipton, there. He uh, he has Monday night meatloaf and double boost. Well, double boost has got his Sunday night cap and so on and uh, so in you know wanting to be like these guys when I grow up I think that uh, at least at one time I'll do this we'll call it uh, cornbread and milk now uh, I know that probably the most of the world has been uh, culturally deprived they don't have cornbread and milk there's a lot of folks that probably never even had any cornbread and if they did it probably some of the imitation Yankee stuff that wouldn't wasn't any good, but here in the in the South, when you when you get cornbread, you don't load it up with sugar. You don't throw a bunch of odd objects in it, like jalapenos and chunks of corn and the stuff that was on the bottom of the refrigerator shelf. Uh, you just put cornbread in it and in a little flour, and, and you you cook it up, and and it comes up to be a nice thick slice of cornbread when you get cornbread off of it, not the little thin rubber stuff that I've seen some of the city gals make and definitely not full of sugar. I tell you cornmeal is not meant to be a sweet uh, at all. It's, you can't make a good corn cake. Cornmeal doesn't go for this sort of thing. It's, uh, it's a good staple for real eating and it's you know real he-man food the way I see it. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some cornbread here. Just all right folks this is what real cornbread looks like. This is real cornbread made by a real southern country girl that knows how to cook it. And when you want cornbread milk, you just crumble it up in your glass like this. You want uh, get a nice big glass so you got lots of it. And you crumble it up in there. And if it's cold now, if you, if you had the cornbread in the refrigerator, you will need to pop it in the microwave for about a half a minute. You don't want to do it too long. Just Microwaves turn bread into rubber. You don't want that. And what you do, you just go ahead and fill this sucker up here. And I'm not very fast at this. I don't want to bore you to death while you're watching me fix it. So you get her full of cornbread, go to the refrigerator, and move all this dark snap out of the way. Sorry about that. I didn't know that there was so much stuff between the uh, the milk and, and the door. You take a nice jug of milk and you just fill this sucker up just like that. And you get a spoon and you eat it. And it's a good complete meal. Sometimes I have a, about another half a glass. That's just pretty filling. You can have a, a complete meal right there and I can tell you that it's good. Something that uh, foreigners and uh, folks too far up north probably never had. I'm not going to eat it for you though. I'm just going to show it to you. Well, I know I said I wasn't going to eat it, but you know, it's been a couple hours since lunch and uh, maybe maybe I really ought to dig into this. Uh, I'll try it and I'll be back in a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was just right. Uh, that was real country cornbread too. It wasn't stuffed full of sugar. I've seen people make cornbread so sweet that Bloomberg would probably want to regulate it. And that's that's a strange guy, you know. He wants to regulate everything in your life. I guess when you get real rich, it makes you a lot smarter than everybody else. <clears throat> and it's proof that you need to tell them how to live. I remember when I heard about the uh, limit on the size of soft drinks in New York City, and I thought, well. It was a joke at first is what I thought, and then when I found out it was, you know, they were really serious about it, I thought, well, how smart you got to be if you want 32 ounces of soft drink to buy two 16s, you know? Jeez, totally impractical and ignorant, but uh, anyway, we'll continue on here in a minute with, uh, with this uh, cornbread and milk. I got to kind of... I don't know for sure why anybody would be interested in any of my family history, but uh, from what I've been told, I wasn't there most of the time. 
they wasn't born yet. But uh, my folks were caught up in the depression and lost all their farm equipment, lost the farm. And like a lot of people, they moved to California like the Okies did. And uh, while they were going in between California and Texas, uh, my, my third oldest brother was born on some Indian reservation in Arizona. I don't know what they were doing there, how long they were there, but uh, my brother didn't have a birth certificate on account of that. It, it got to be a problem when he got old enough for Social Security. Uh, he was pretty lucky there was a couple of ladies left that were old enough to remember when or where he was born and could uh, sign an affidavit to that. He wouldn't have been able to get Social Security if they hadn't remembered it. Uh, in some place during that time, my folks were friend, befriending an old Indian guy. I don't, I don't know uh, what his name was. It, it seems like I heard him refer to him as Chief. You know, it's probably a nickname or something. Uh, but uh, like people did back then, they had a, one of those hand cranked uh, ice cream makers, and uh, they liked to make ice cream whenever they got the stuff together. And so my mother'd make ice cream, and this old Indian guy would come over and and have some ice cream with him, but he, he wouldn't eat any of it until he saw my mother eat some of it because he was afraid they were going to poison him. I, I guess that's understandable, that, you know, white folks speak, speaking with a forked tongue and all. But uh, my oldest brother told me that he, he had wandered off from the place, and uh, I guess how they met this guy is because he, had, he had took my brother the hand and led him back to where my parents were, and that, that's what I, I believe is the way they got to know the guy. Uh, my folks wound up in California, and my dad got a, a job as a foreman on a road job. And they built a road somewhere. And that job ran out, and he went back to looking for a job, and he came across another one. Well, more and more hungry people had arrived in the meantime, and uh, he didn't realize that the the price of labor was going down every day and when he went to get the next job they offered him about half what he had had on the previous job and he turned it down and that didn't turn out to be a good decision because I think that was about his last chance to get a job so they uh, they turned around and decided to go back to my grandfather's place in uh, North Texas and they had an old Model T and they, they set off in that thing and and when they got about a day away from my grandfather's house, they, they figured they had just enough money to uh, buy a tire if they had a blowout or something and, uh, and buy some food for the baby, which is my third oldest brother, just the baby. So they decided they wouldn't eat nothing all day until they got to grandpa's house. And my oldest brother could tell me he, I don't know how old he was, but probably about five or something, maybe six. He said he was standing on the, the, the floorboard uh, in the back of that uh, Model T, and he got to thinking about it. He was hungry. And he was unhappy about the whole situation. And he started to complain about it and could cry real loud so that everybody could get an idea of just how, how he felt about the situation. He said my, my dad slammed on the brakes on that Model T and turned around and backhanded him back up against the seat. And he told him, he says, we're all hungry here, and we all or miserable. He says, you can cry all you want to, but keep it to yourself. I don't hear none of it. And uh, that was sort of my dad's way. If you got you got out what he figured out a line, he would take care of it right there on the on the spot. My brother said it was way after dark time they got to my grandfather's house and said my grandmother went down in the storm cellar and got a big old jar of hominy. Uh, some of you folks up north or foreign places probably don't know what hominy is, but it's made out of corn. They uh, they take corn. I guess it's already on the shelf and only on the cob. It's got hard, you know, and all. They they soak it in a an alkaline mixture, you know. Uh, I guess uh, whatever they had live probably, and uh, you soak it and then you rinse it four or five times. It makes the kernel swell up nice and big. And depending on which white corn or, or yellow corn, they you know you'll have white hominy or yellow hominy or whatever. But he said that. That was the best food he had ever ate. <laughs> you know, be, <coughs> excuse me, being, uh, being hungry will improve your appetite quite a bit. Uh, 
I know he must have been hungry because I remember my grandmother's cooking. We went over there every Sunday, at least while we lived out in West Texas, we did. We went over there every Sunday, and she was a horrible cook. I, I mean, I swear she put, she put black pepper on everything, just tons of it. And when she made tea, she would just boil all the stuff out of the tea bags. That's, that's where I come to call certain really strong tea, West Texas tea. But it's a habit out there. And most people make tea, they'll boil that tea bag until they've got everything out of it, including the starch out of the bag. And it makes some really strong tea. I, in fact, until I got grown, I didn't like tea because that stuff was just a bit strong, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, they they took up a, a little spot down the road from my grandfather. And they built a dugout. I, I don't know if uh, most people know. But you get up against the side of a hill and you dig up into there and you shore it up with some boards and you make a front door and the front wall out of wood. And the rest of the house is mostly dirt. And my uh, my brother said that Model T disappeared about then, so he figures that my dad sold it to buy the the lumber for what part of the house wasn't dirt, you know. And he got him a job at a cotton gin about I don't know about a mile down the road. He'd he'd get up in the morning, walk down to the cotton gin, put in twelve hours, walk back home. And uh, during during that time, uh, they had a, a night watchman at the uh, cotton gin. I, I don't know what he was watching for, but anyway, they had one. And this night watchman was always complaining about this stray dog that would come through there. And give you an idea of a cotton gin, it's got room after room after room going all the way down this long corrugated tin building. And there's doors on the same side of every one of those rooms going all the way down it. So if the doors are open, you can see from one end of the cut gin to the other, you know, inside there. And uh, one day that, that stray dog come wandering in there at the other end of the gin. And that guard got to complaining about it. My dad told him, let me have that pistol there. He had one of those little 38 revolvers. My dad took a aim down there and fired it. He hit that dog. And he said he was just as surprised as anybody, but he didn't let on. He said he, he just was going to scare the dog off. But... Uh, and I watched him there for that. I always thought he was a crack shot. <laughs> it was mostly just an accident. Uh, I guess working in a, in a in a place like that, probably a lot of hard work. I've been around some kind of like it. And cotton jets tend to be dusty and hot. And out behind them, they got a big old pit in the ground they call the burr pit, where they take all the burrs off the outside of the cotton and they burn it out there to get rid of it. And there, there's a fire down in the middle of it. It may look calm and quiet on the top, just a little smoke drifting up, but way down inside of the embers that burn for, I don't know, weeks on end. And uh, you don't necessarily see any fire on the top because they just keep piling fresh burrs on the top of it, and all the fires way down at the bottom. I, I remember kind of wading off in there before the buddy. It probably wasn't a good thing to do, but uh, we did it. His dad was a the guy that owned the, the cotton gin. In fact, he, he's a guy I named uh, my son after, uh, just on account of uh, being friends.